Have you ever wondered what's actually happening in your brain when you're experiencing OCD symptoms, when certain worries you just can't let go of no matter what you do, when you feel like you can't control your behaviors? Stick around because we're diving deep into the science of OCD and what's really going on in the brain and what you can do about it. My name is Uma Chatterjee. I'm a neuroscientist who studies the neurobiology of OCD and novel treatments. And I'm someone who has lived experience of severe OCD myself. I was debilitated for decades before receiving evidence-based treatment, which saved my life. And I am dedicated to not only studying how OCD works in the brain, but sharing it with our community so that we can understand what's going on and what we can do about it. And today I'm going to share how this research helps us understand Stand and treat OCD through exposure and response prevention therapy and other modalities. We're going to be talking about the critical brain circuits behind obsessive compulsive disorder, how our genes and environment can shape these circuits, and why certain thoughts feel stuck. We're then going to talk about how ERP, exposure and response prevention, uses this science to help us break free from this cycle and live a full and beautiful life in recovery. Before we get into the science, let's talk about what OCD actually is. OCD is not a quirk or a trait or an adjective. Nobody is so OCD or a little OCD. It's not about what we love or prefer. It's not a word to describe us needing things a certain way just because we like it. OCD is a debilitating disorder that consists of obsessions, which are not obsessions like we're obsessed with Taylor Swift or with pizza. Obsessions in this case are intrusive, unwanted, persistent thoughts that we can't get rid of because of our brain which we'll talk about later. And then we do compulsions, which are behaviors that we do not want to do. We don't want to have those thoughts we're having and we don't want to do these behaviors, but we feel like we have to in order to make these thoughts go away. It is not a choice. At its worst, it can completely take someone's life from them. Intrusive thoughts can be about literally anything, any topic, especially taboo and harm themes that we don't talk about as much, but they're all OCD. They're ego dystonic. We do not agree with or like these thoughts they just pop in our head and we don't want to do these behaviors. At its worst, OCD can take over someone's life. And in my case, I was left completely housebound. I couldn't function. I couldn't do anything. And I was really fighting for my life. And treatment turned everything around for me. From the outside, living through how painful and horrific OCD can be is why I study the brain, why I try to understand how OCD works and how we can intervene to treat it. What I love about neuroscience and biology is that when we understand this underlying brain machinery, we can not only help demystify how OCD works, but we can also debunk the myths and stereotypes of OCD because we can understand OCD as a biological condition that involves certain neural loops and we can understand what influences said loops. So let's get into the neuroscience of OCD. We're going to start with the different brain structures that are involved in OCD. We get this information from human imaging studies as well as many preclinical, cellular, molecular, systems level work in different species and models. So starting with the core structures in the OCD circuit, we'll start with the orbital frontal cortex or the OFC. It's right behind your forehead. The OFC is your brain's what's important center. It decides salience, what to pay attention to or what to worry about. In OC, this region can overdetect or exaggerate potential threats or other forms of information that might not stick out to someone without OCD. For example, like I might be contaminated or, oh, this horrible thought I had about someone means something about me and it keeps sending these alarm bells. We also have a structure called the anterior cingulate cortex, the ACC. It's near the midline of your brain's frontal region and the ACC typically monitors conflict and error. When it's hyperactive, it can more consistently signal the feeling of something's off and it can fuel anxiety or distress or an urgent need to resolve the doubt or uncertainty or fix something or check something. And then very deep 
deeper in our brain, we have a structure called the striatum, which is part of the basal ganglia. The striatum influences habit formation and it modulates the go actions, doing something and no go when we inhibit our actions. In OCD, it can get stuck, which could then drive unwanted repetitive behaviors. Once the orbital frontal cortex, the OFC, calls something highly important or salient, like for example, an intrusive thought about harming someone that you don't actually resonate with, but your OFCs tell you is important because it's so distressing and scary and it can't filter that out as well, or maybe a doorknob that you fear is contaminated, or the mole that you found on your shoulder could be cancer. The striatum then compels us to perform that ritual, whatever that compulsion is, mental or physical, like rumination or seeking reassurance or hand washing again and again and again. Then we have the thalamus, which acts sort of as a relay station. It funnels sensory and cognitive information upward and overactivation of the thalamus or poor gating of the thalamus here can mean that intrusive thoughts keep passing through to conscious attention and reinforces the cycle of OCD. Thus, we tie that all together into the cortical striatal thalamic cortical loop, the CSTC loop. Then we get into neurotransmitters and chemicals that facilitate communication between these brain regions and the cells in these brain regions. One of the most popular neurotransmitters, neuromodulators that you've probably heard of is serotonin. It's typically known for things like mood regulation. In the case of OCD and just broadly, serotonin helps modulate how strongly signals get passed in this loop. And dysregulation can mean amplified alarm bells. Think of serotonin like a volume knob turning things up and down in your brain. And serotonin receptors exist in many parts of the brain. So when we're treating things with serotonin related medications, we're turning things up and down very broadly across the brain. Then we have something called dopamine, which you've probably also heard of in the context of motivation. Related to OCD, dopamine is extremely involved in behaviors and specifically repetitive behaviors. In OCD, excess dopamine in certain pathways can fuel compulsions by causing more behaviors to happen and less behaviors to be inhibited hence the compulsion aspect. And it can make you feel like you're locked into behaviors that you just don't want to do. Then we have glutamate and GABA. Glutamate's actually found widely across the brain in about 60% of cells, way more than serotonin and dopamine. And glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. It excites loops. GABA conversely, is an inhibitory neurotransmitter and it calms loops down. As you can imagine then, an imbalance in glutamate and GABA levels can tip you into overdrive and feel like it's impossible to switch off this persistent cycle of OCD. These chemicals are working to make sure that you're flagging what's critical, what is salient. And if the system misfires, like labeling intrusive, unwanted thoughts that don't relate to our values or desires at all as important, as life-threatening, as something that actually means something about ourselves, that perceived salience will hold our attention hostage and we're stuck in the loop of OCD instead of what's real world. You might be wondering about genes and their role in all of this. Our current understanding of the research has us estimating that OCD is about 40% genetics. So not 100%, but definitely a substantial amount of contribution to OCD. Now, why do genes matter? What do they do in our bodies and in our brains that relates to ultimately how we experience OCD? Well, certain genes shape how different parts of our brain develop, how those cells develop, what they look like, what they express. So for example, our orbital frontal cortex or our striatum are influenced by the way that our genes tell our brain to grow and to be shaped and all the cells within it, how to communicate and what they do. Genes also tell our brain how much neurotransmitters can get released and get reabsorbed. Absorbed. And for a whole host of reasons, you can be born with different variants that ultimately raises the risk and threshold of you developing diagnostic clinical OCD. Importantly, these genes don't guarantee OCD, but they can definitely set up a more reactive circuit, a predisposition to OCD symptoms. And at a certain point, it can up the risk of developing OCD under the proper circumstances. When you combine that with stress and environmental factors, you've got a loop that's primed 
seems to overreact and then turn into clinical diagnostic OCD that can take over your whole life. OCD can look different in different people though. Sometimes people identify with having OCD from the time that they were born, like me. Some people can remember a distinct moment in time in which their brain quote unquote broke and that their OCD went from zero to a hundred. Some people can see a general progression of having more symptoms, but it not being super severe. And at a certain point it crossed over to being super severe. And all of that can happen at different ages for different people. With all of that though, once someone finally has OCD, sometimes people report having it all the time until treatment and then it does go down. Some people have ebbs and flows. When people are experiencing those episodes where their obsessions and compulsions ramp up and then ease and then resurface later, why? Oftentimes it can be environmental triggers like big life changes, high stress that can dial up that loop we talked about, the cortical striatal thalamic loop, as well as other brain structures that are involved and communicating with all of those structures. It can turn up that loop, especially if you're already genetically prone. And in other times, when you're in calmer phases of your life or your more supportive environments, those factors might reduce or not flare that circuit's overdrive as much. So it can ebb and flow. That is totally normal. And that's just a response of your brain to your life. So if your genes are predisposed to a hypersensitive orbitofrontal cortex or striatum, then intense situations like exams, new jobs, illnesses, breakups, hard things just may throw them into overdrive. And once that loop is lit, you'll probably notice more potential threats as super salient and super important. The same thoughts that didn't distress you before are now distressing you and nothing's changed except for your brain's reaction to those thoughts. That's our high level understanding of why symptoms can appear and fade and then return if new stressors come along. There are many hormones such as cortisol that can further amplify brain activity. Picture pouring gasoline on a fire. If your salient signals were already on high alert, can turn them into a blaring siren. So that's all the science of what's going on in our brain when we're in the thick of OCD, but what can we do about it? The amazing news is that while your brain can change in a direction that perhaps might cause you distress and pain, like going from not having OCD to having OCD, you also can change your brain in treatment and recovery through a concept that maybe you've heard of called neuroplasticity. On a high level, that means that our brains are able to change themselves in response to new information, new actions, treatment. Think about it. We are changing every single day by the experiences we have, the people we meet, the things we learn. And that applies to OCD treatment as well, especially through exposure and response prevention, ERP. In this treatment, you are facing your intrusive thoughts, your obsessions, and you learn how you don't have to perform compulsions in response to those obsessions, thus helping chip away at that loop and chip away at your OCD. It can feel terrifying at first. Believe me, I understand. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done. It's also one of the most rewarding things I've ever done with my life. And I'm still in ERP today because it allows me the freedom to be able to record this video and live my life and study OCD full circle. How does ERP rewire this loop? It's decreasing this overstated, overwhelming salience and interrupting the habit cycle through progressive steps. By not doing the compulsions in relation to your obsession immediately, for example, by not seeking reassurance for or ruminating on intrusive harm, sexual thoughts that you might be having, or by not immediately washing your hands after exposing yourself to a contamination trigger, you're teaching your orbital frontal cortex, your OFC, that maybe this intrusive thought, this fear, this distress is not so dire. It's not life-threatening and I don't need to give it attention. And over time, the OFC is going to learn to tag that situation and any situation similar to that as less critical. Following that, the striatum's urge to act repetitively and compulsively in response to those thoughts will lessen. And then the thalamus will stop flooding our attention and our physiological signals with that same alarm. Normally, performing those compulsions provides temporary relief to us. Otherwise, why would we be doing it? Thus reinforcing that obsession and compulsion cycle. But with ERP, you stay with that anxiety, shame, fear, stress, disgust, whatever the feeling is that drives 
drives your obsession. You let that feeling peak, which is very hard. I completely understand. I'm still doing it, but it's the best thing we can do. When we let it peak for the first time, we're able to watch it decline and we're able to see that we can tolerate that high level of distress without doing compulsions. Our circuit is now learning that it doesn't need that ritual, that compulsion, that behavior to be safe. Trained, specialized ERP therapists guide you gradually like a ladder of challenges so that you're not jumping straight into the deep end, into your scariest, most horrendous situation. And repetition of these exposures and building up your skill set helps reshape how your brain can ultimately categorize risk, the tolerance of those feelings, and then it lets the system relax more quickly than it would before. It is important to know that ERP isn't curing OCD. It's not magically erasing all of our intrusive thoughts. It's a lifelong skill that trains your brain to handle them differently. You're building resilience. You're building trust in yourself. You're able to see that even if an intrusive thought arises, the intrusive thought doesn't have ultimate power over our actions anymore. We do through ERP, through evidence-based treatment to support OCD. That's all about what we know about OCD, but there's so much more to learn. We have so much more to understand more deeply how this circuit is acting, all of the different contributors to the circuit, how OCD develops in people, what is the tipping point by which people develop OCD, perhaps in different people, it can look differently, and what are better ways that we can intervene to treat this horrific debilitating disorder. Also, what are more ways that we can make existing treatments like ERP more effective and accessible to everyone? We are doing so much work as a field to answer all of those questions and more. In humans, we are working to develop better technology to be able to more deeply scan people's brains and watch them in real time, track them over years to track development, response to treatment and all of the things. Because as it stands, scans do not diagnose OCD. We're able to see differences in groups of people with versus without OCD, but we cannot identify OCD in a person. That would be amazing. So we're working on developing that. We're working to understand things on more of a cellular and molecular level. What looks different in people with OCD and how does that contribute to developing and treating the disorder? We're looking at novel treatment options, different drugs, different neuromodulation techniques, non-invasive technology to modulate how the brain's working, better targets for deep brain stimulation surgery, and so much more to help expand our toolkit for treating OCD and to make ERP even more tolerable and easy to do for people to take that leap of faith when ERP can feel so hard at the beginning. We're looking at genes. We're looking at genome-wide association studies to find more common variants that help us understand what people in OCD have that people without OCD don't have. We need far more people in those studies and it's going to be years of work to get there, but we are doing it. Ultimately, that can help us understand how our brain is forming, how those influence OCD in the brain, and provide us with new therapeutic targets. Also, because not everyone's OCD looks the same, future treatments hopefully will customize things like ERP based on a person's unique brain activation pattern or genetic profile. The idea is precision, precision medicine, precision psychiatry, so that we can customize treatment to the individual and tackle the exact node in the circuit that is giving people the most trouble. Even though we have a long way to go to more fully understand how OCD works and how to treat it, the good news is that there are decades of research that consistently show that ERP can be so effective and life-saving for so many people. Yes, OCD can still ebb and flow, but there's so much power in knowing that you can train that loop. You can build your tools and your skills to calm that overactive salience and ultimately live a life of freedom, not trapped so much by intrusive thoughts. Even if and when you relapse or you're experiencing times when OCD is harder than other times, remember the upward spiral. You are never meeting OCD at the same point that you met it before. You are always meeting it with more skills, more information, and more trust within yourself that you've done it before, you face it before, and you can face it again. The main takeaways from this, remember the OCD loop, the overactive orbital frontal cortex, the striatum, the thalamus, plus gene influence, neurotransmitter imbalances. Remember that the brain, salience is meant to be helpful, but it can go awry, especially with OCD. The brain is flagging harmless things as major threats or things to give your attention to. OCD can ebb and flow with impacts from stress and environment and genetic sensitivity and flaring symptoms. But through all of that, ERP is an effective evidence-based treatment that can totally change how you engage with your OCD and help you reclaim your life by gradually confronting your obsessions and intrusive thoughts, breaking your reliance on compulsions and rituals and retraining your brain's alarm system. If you're dealing with OCD,
OCD, you are not alone. Millions worldwide live with OCD and ERP offers a real path forward to change. Check out nocd.com to find specialists who understand the science and can guide you through exposure and response prevention therapy. Remember that science is on your side. You can quiet the loop and reclaim your life. I did. I believe in you. I'm right on that path with you and I am forever cheering you on on your journey. Thank you for watching this and for your interest in the science of OCD. 